The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. One thing we're trying to do is to understand something about these populations that are still left, if there are certain reasons they've managed to hang on. We can furnish the firearm, we can furnish the ammunition, we can furnish the place to hunt. All they have to bring with them is desire to go hunting and enjoy the outdoors. Going off trail tramples vegetation and disturbs wildlife, and going off trail could lead you into poison ivy or other surprises. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. They're a symbol of the American West and a symbol of our independence and uniqueness. If you were picking a mascot for the state of Texas, you'd have to consider one small reptile with a legendary reputation. They are the state reptile, Texas. The Texas horned lizard. But you'd better hurry. While they're known by many names. Horned toads, horned frogs, but they're actually horned lizards. Horned lizard numbers are shrinking. This particular ant mound was just discovered this year, this spring. These folks aren't looking for ants as much as answers. If there's horned lizards in the area, this is the kind of place I would see them coming back to. In many places they once lived, horned lizards have vanished. It's just kind of sad to think that something that was at one time as common as the horned lizard in Texas is getting to a point where you just hardly see them even when you look for them. As we go out and visit with ranchers, it's one of the first things they ask us, what's happened to the horned lizards? That question has biologists scrambling to study them in the places they're still doing well. Up in the southeast panhandle, Texas horned lizard uh, still very common in this part of the state. Chip Ruthven has been chasing horned lizards for many of his years in the field. We catch most of our horned lizards simply by driving down the roads and encountering them on the roads. You are not, oh, there he goes. While they're not normally hard to catch. Hey, where did you go? They are well camouflaged. Oh, there he is. We have a mark recapture program. We'll uh, capture those animals temporarily, collect a variety of, of data off of them, weights, measurements. We'll take the clip, kind of clip it on the base of one horn, and then lift the lizard up. And there we got a weight of 25 grams capture the GPS coordinates of each lizard where we caught them, uh, and then mark those individuals. 116 millimeters total length. We've marked over a thousand here on this management area. For the lizards, marking means a rather severe pedicure. Flip over two R toe. They get around pretty good without a toe or two. Clipping specific toe combinations identifies each lizard. And those lost toes serve another purpose. I will mail it off to TCU and they will do their genetic work on it. Texas Christian University is receiving horned toed toes and other samples in the mail these days. I thought it would be a natural because it's TCU's mascot. The lizard lab work happens here, supervised by Dean Williams. Here's some more samples from Chet, Richard. Dean and his students are extracting DNA from cells to learn just how genetically unique horned lizard populations are around the state. What we have found so far is that they do seem to be highly genetically variable, at least in the matador. 
populations that may have particularly low genetic variation that might indicate, okay, that population is experiencing problems right now. This genetic information will also be critical if horned lizards are ever to be restored to places where they have disappeared. Other research to prepare for that possibility is happening nearby at the Fort Worth Zoo. So how are the horned lizards doing? Doing very well on their diets? Good. Diane Barber and her staff are successfully keeping horned lizards at the zoo, and they're learning how to make more. We're one of the few institutions that have ever bred them in captivity. <laughs> Looks like she's not interested today. We'll have to try again tomorrow. They're a hard creature to keep alive because of their specialized diet and their light requirements. While captive breeding may help restore populations down the road, keeping horn lizards healthy in the wild still means having a better understanding of what they eat and where they live. And some of the places they live may surprise you. We have an isolated population of horned lizards on this coastal barrier island. Okay. Ashley Inslee works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Leanne Lynham and a group of volunteers have come to Matagorda Island to help with her research. One thing we're trying to do is to understand something about these populations that are still left, if there are certain reasons they've managed to hang on, and what that could tell us about conservation and maybe restoration of horned lizards. On the island, the crew hits the road, looking for lizards. And they have a large area to cover. It's a long, narrow strip of land that these horn lizards inhabit, almost 40 miles long. And we can check it when we get up there. Yeah. See if we've got any critters. So far today, we haven't caught anything. Traps have been set, but have nothing to offer. I got a grasshopper. <laughs> So the spotters scan the roadsides from shore to shore. I see one stop. And eventually, All right, let's go. they find a lizard. Beautiful. So it's 76.72. As in the panhandle, we're going to take the third toe. The lizard loses a digit. Put some neosporin on it. This time to analyze its diet. To get an isotopic reading from this guy. This DNA sample is somewhat less invasive. The swab. To our human mind, it's a little insulting. <laughs> but this lizard's big day is not over yet. So I'll put some super glue. We are gonna powder tracker. So we are gonna attach the fur patch. And what we do is we coat it with a fluorescent powder, release it, then in the evening we can go back and with a black light, track the horn lizard and see specifically what grasses they're using, if they're using a path, if they're frequenting certain ant mounds as opposed to others. There you go. So it's really been a convenient, efficient way to gauge the habitat that they are using. Well, the fire ant, uh, pesticide use, those are probably compounding factors. Uh, the significant reason for the decline in the Texas horned lizard is uh, probably habitat loss. Not Mark, so he'll be a new one to collect some data off of. Studying horn lizards in their natural habitat may be the only way to keep them from fading into history. Toe clip code 2R7. Though there remain more questions than answers about the long-term health of horn lizards, it's clear they still have some friends. It appears that the toad is still alive. It's a horny toad. Yeah! Don't think there's anybody that doesn't like horn toad. Toad, it's a horny toad. It's kind of like the mascot of Texas. You don't have to get folks excited about horned lizards because they love them already. So they got an ugly face. He's a little horny toad. You know what they eat? Ants. Ants. Almost 80% of their diet is harvester ants. Wow. A little interest can go a long way towards saving a threatened species. I guess you could close them up and put them in the freezer. That genetic study at TCU is funded by sales of horned lizard license plates. This is the second tiny one today. Volunteers collect valuable information around the state. They adorable. Once you see your first horned lizard and you realize how imminent their demise could be, you can't help but try to get involved and try to do something. We've got 20% grasses. The study and preservation 
native habitat continues. Bottom line is, is to determine practices to manage habitats for horned lizards. And what helps the horned lizard will almost certainly help other wildlife. There's a lot of other species too that maybe are not as popular or well known as horned lizards, but they face the same plight. What's going to benefit horned lizards is going to benefit most grassland species. Let him go on his merry way. Live long and prosper and raise lots of baby horny toes. beautiful state and we need your help keeping it that way. Imagine if every person who went out in nature left behind a trace of their presence. But it is possible to both preserve and enjoy the great outdoors. We call this Leave No Trace. First up, be prepared. Research the area you're visiting to find out what facilities are available. Check for burn bans and other restrictions. Make sure you have the right gear, and that includes being prepared for changes in weather. It's this way. Once you're out in the park, stick to the trails. The way. Going off trail tramples vegetation and disturbs wildlife. And going off trail could lead you into poison ivy or other surprises. Look for the tent pad or flattened area to put your tent. If there aren't any burn bans, minimize your campfire's impact by using established fire rings. Mm -hmm. Build only as big a fire as needed for the cooking at hand, and make sure to always douse your fire completely. If you pack it in, pack it out. Properly dispose of your trash in a dumpster or trash receptacle. You can also help the rangers by picking up pieces of trash that you find. Want some natural souvenirs? Take pictures. It's a violation of state law to remove resources from the park, things like rocks, plants, and other natural objects. Respect wild animals in their natural habitat and from a safe distance. Never feed wildlife. Human food is harmful, even deadly to wildlife, and can cause them to lose their fear of people. Okay, here they come, Dad. <laughs> and finally, be considerate of other visitors. Avoid walking through others' campsites, keep the volume down, and respect the park's quiet hours so folks can enjoy the sounds of nature. Just a few simple things can make a big difference. Thanks for keeping Texas wild. Where's this one coming from? It's gonna be number one, it's gonna go out straight away. This is Zach. And his cousin, Sean. Call it like you were gonna shoot it. Pull. Be patient now. Right. Boom, right? Let her rip. Both are taking part Very nice. good. and taking aim in a weekend duck hunt. Pull. Perfect. It tested like everything, like how much, if he knew how to lead and if he knew where it was coming from and followed through with it. While skeet shooting provides a warm up, the Katy Prairie outside of Houston is the backdrop for this completely outfitted outdoor adventure. So what we do is we offer a program and uh, once they've got their hunter education and they have their hunting license, we can take care of everything else. We can furnish the firearm, we can furnish the ammunition, we furnish the place to hunt. All they have to bring with them is desire to go hunting and enjoy the outdoors. So there's a lot of different species. You know, it's not always just gonna be one certain duck on the pond. Our primary birds are gonna be teal, pintail, Shovelers, which we call them spoonbills. Y'all know why we call them spoonbills, right? You see that big noticeable, like a spatula. It's a big old spoon on their bill. Spoonies, they'll answer to your mallard drake or your mallard hen. The hen really does all the talking. She's out there going. <laughs> this is what we're mainly going to be calling tomorrow. Gentlemen, y'all get in line. Get you something to eat. We got Fritos if you'd rather have like a Frito pie. It's been a long day and all chow down before the big hunt in the morning. What time are we getting up? We're getting up at five o'clock like normal time. Five o'clock in the, in the morning? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. This is it for tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> no.
5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> this is the first time we've ever been hunting. Ever. It's exciting. <laughs> it is. I think I'm, I'm more excited than he is, I think. <laughs> you guys all set? I can range Reveille. <laughs> the thrill of the hunt. About time to rise and shine. Hogs need feeding, cows need milking. And y'all got birds waiting on you. Did you get any sleep? Uh, no. I think it was in between me snoring and him snoring and that guy yeah. snoring. We all took turns snoring. Did you get any sleep? A little bit. <laughs> but around midnight night, your plugs fell out and I couldn't find them. I guess we're doing waders and going into a pond or something somewhere. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what we're doing. It's going to be deep at first, but it'll end up being about this deep when we get to walking. So just stay in single file. Take your time. We got plenty of time, okay? Remember, guys, you see a log, run. <laughs> Zigzag pattern, no straight. You all right, Mom? Uh, yeah. Here, let me have your hand, I'll help you out. There you go. The plan in this particular situation is to get them to come into the hole that we've created in the decoys. They're naturally attracted to that void in the decoy spread. <laughs> yeah, he landed way out there. What we see out in front of us where we're actually hunting is some broken marsh area where you can see some grasses and other different types of plants coming up that are attractive to the ducks. These wetlands and the surrounding pristine coastal prairie habitat have been wiped out, replaced with suburbs and subdivisions. The Katy Prairie Conservancy and its preserve is one of the few places left that offers up hunting this close to Houston. Everybody situated? The ducks are kind of coming from the right and the left, and some of them are even coming from that way. Shoot him. Straight up, shoot him. Start at his butt, come through, and right as your gun clears his head, Bang. slap it. But keep swinging. If you stop swinging, he's going to fly past your pattern. I believe it's important for the kids to come out and Boom. see the quality of life that the Katy Prairie has to offer in such close proximity, one of the largest cities in the country. Are you excited? Yeah. The benefits that a place like this offers kids and their parents to be able to bond is tremendous. I'm kind of nervous and I'm excited that it's my first hunt and we've been practicing out in the range. Straight up, shoot that duck straight up. I had a lead on that one. They're right there. Out front. Good shot. Got him. <laughs> and the dog. It's kind of an adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's like, whoa, it surprises you. You just show up. They have decoys, they have dogs, they have calls. You know, if you don't have duck hunting equipment, then you can go and see if duck hunting is your thing. Straight up, shoot that duck straight up. Got him. Who shot second? <laughs> got him down there. Ooh, that was a good shot. <laughs> Dang! That one came from, it kind of came from like the middle and like kind of turned up and went to the left and a bunch of us were shooting at him. I didn't realize it was in the water, you know, that we were going to be in the water the whole time. Yeah, just turn the heat up a little bit. <laughs> 
that's something that he wants to do. You know, that's something he can do forever. Take them, get them. They've started out with the gun safety and, and have taught him, you know, for all the way from beginning to the end. All right, stay low on the left, on the left. Get ready, get ready, shoot him, shoot him. Good job, guys. <laughs> it's been great, we got a duck, <laughs> one. <laughs> it's a great program that they put on out here. You know, who else doesn't want to go hunting with their son, you know? Laying in the water, having fun. All right. That was actually pretty fun. It was. It wasn't near as bad as I was thinking it was going to be. He wanted to go hunting, and if it wasn't for this program, you know, I could have never exposed him to that. Then this is something that we can do together, and he still wants me around for it. <laughs> I think the greatest thing about bringing the kids out and seeing them smile is, is knowing that you're giving them something that they'll literally remember the rest of their life. Yeah, I made it. It was fun. Um, we bonded a lot today, and we're going to bond, I guess, bond some more throughout the weekend. I had plenty of fun. That's what it's all about, baby. All right. One thing I love about Curtis Creek, you can always be pretty much guaranteed you're gonna catch a fish. Woohoo! I got me. About an hour's drive southwest of Dallas is Curtis Creek State Park. I love to see kids catch fish. Yeah, that's great stuff. The main draw here is a 355-acre lake and the great fishing that comes with it. We have an excellent fishery here, catch and release only on a largemouth bass, and that brings a lot of your anglers out, your professionals and your amateurs, because they all have a great chance of catching a really nice fish. Oh, look at that. The lake was designed specifically for fishing, and the locals know it as the best little bass lake in Texas. Day and night, anglers flock to Purtis Creek in hopes of hooking a big one. You gotta give me a fish. Small. Not bad. Give me a fish. Oh my god, he jumped off. Never mind. No Can't way. Fit. I saw him. That's bad. Just nice, peaceful time we enjoy. Go back and grow. Paddling tours of Purtis Creek will take you deep into the piney woods. Well, guys, right now we're actually trespassing. So we all need to be on our best behavior and try to sneak out of here where we won't get caught. We're on the territory now of the beavers. We had an excellent response to our canoe tour. You know, you can go to the zoo, you can see snakes and different wildlife, but out here you're seeing nature as it really is. For the little ones, Nothing beats a good swimming pool on a hot Texas day. It's a really nice area for families to come out. It's a nice controlled environment to bring your family out to. And then there are those who come to Purtis Creek State Park to do Three, four, five, six. not much of anything at all. Really good people come here. They're out here to swim, to fish, to canoe. It's a great outing. Good job.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.